Okay, so today we will finish up chapter 34. Now this is the end of the material that will uh, be covered on midterm two. So midterm two will cover only what we've covered since the first midterm. So just chapters uh, 32, 33, and 34 will be on midterm two. And then uh, do be aware though that your final will be cumulative. So the final, um, after we're done with uh, this second midterm, we'll have Thanksgiving break and then we'll come back and we have only two more weeks, only two more chapters chapters 35 and 36 and then the final uh, so we're almost we're almost there almost done um, the final will be cumulative but we'll focus more on the chapters that you weren't tested on yet so we'll focus a little bit more on chapters 35 and 36 but you still uh, obviously need to know all of the materials so there definitely will be a you know at least one question on waves so you definitely need to know uh, the things that we went over in the beginning of the quarter now, as for the midterm on Tuesday, it's going to be exactly like the, the first midterm, same format, same setup, uh, same procedures where you upload your work. If you had trouble logging in, I'll have the Zoom meeting available again. If you have trouble accessing the Zoom meeting, I think most people that had trouble accessing it were having trouble because their Zoom account wasn't authorized. So make sure that you have your, uh, your Zoom account is with your uci.edu email and that it's been authorized. Uh, so I would highly suggest going through that practice. I still have a, a practice midterm with Respondus uh, if you go into quizzes where there's a Zoom meeting available. So I'd highly recommend just, just going through that just so that you know that your uh, Zoom account is authorized and that you can sign in that way. Uh, so everything else, like I said, will be the same. Uh, you'll have 130 minutes, sorry, you'll have an hour and a half, so 90 minutes. Uh, you'll have 90 minutes again to complete the exam, so you get an extra 10 minutes, uh, you know, just to go over things. Make sure you, an you enter your answers into the boxes on Canvas. Uh, make sure you circle those answers on your paper, and then make sure that you upload your work to Canvas. There'll be another, uh, you know, assignment titled Midterm 2 Work. Make sure you upload your work there uh, as soon as you're done. Now, if uh, we have the same problem again where uh, some of you guys are having trouble logging into Canvas uh, at the start of the exam, don't worry about that. Uh, it seems like Canvas sometimes at 8 a.m., sometimes when I'm posting uh, the lectures or trying to make an announcement at 8 a.m., Canvas for some reason doesn't really work that well at 8 a.m. I think a lot of people are using it at that time. So if you are having trouble logging in or it's being really slow, just give it 15 minutes and then come back to it 15 minutes later or 20 minutes later. As long as you start the exam uh, within like a reasonable amount of time, so in case there's issues again, I would say as long as you start it, you know, by like 8.20 or something like that, that should be fine. So if you need to just come back to it 15 minutes later and give it a few minutes to kind of calm down, that's totally fine. You don't have to start. Um, you're not going to lose that 15 minutes if you can't log on. You have to wait. Uh, you'll still get the full 90 minutes once you start. Now that being said, you do have to start your exam at about 8 a.m. Uh, you can't start your exam at 9.30, you can't start it at 10 a.m. Uh, make sure that you start it at lecture time so that you're done by about 9.30, uh, 9.45 if you started a little bit late. Now it did uh, cause a little bit of confusion last time because I, I made the exam available from 8 to 12. Now the reason I do that is because if I make it only available from 8 to 9.30, if you have trouble logging on and you, let's say, log on at 8.15, it will kick you out at 9.30, even though you still have that extra 15 minutes of time, uh, or you should have an extra 15 minutes to finish your exam. If I make it only available until 9.30, it'll just kick you off at 9.30, and I want you to get the full 90 minutes, even if we have trouble logging into Canvas. Uh, and then the DSC students also are uh, allotted extra time, and I don't want to make, like, you know, 10 different exams for every... Uh, every person that gets different time. So I just have one, one uh, availability for the exam. Uh, so don't, don't think that just because it's available until 12 that you can do your exam at like uh, 10.30 to 12 o'clock. You have to start at lecture time. I expect everybody to be taking the exam from 8 to 9.30. Uh, and if I see anybody who's taking the exam, like if you log in at 9.30 or you log in at 10 o'clock, um, your exam is just going to be a zero. So make sure that you start your exam at lecture time. Okay, so I think that's all of our exam stuff so we can get started on our uh, chapter 34 today. Now today we're going to be talking about thin lenses. So a thin lens is exactly what it sounds like. It's a thin lens. So 
most optical devices that we see, most lenses are thin lenses. The uh, you know most common examples are uh, glasses and contact lenses are thin lenses. So a thin lens just means it has two spherical surfaces and they're very close together so that the thickness is like essentially zero. Uh, you know, if you look at your, you know, if you look at a pair of glasses, like yes, the, the lens here has some thickness, but when we're comparing that thickness to, you know, objects that we're looking at that are uh, quite a ways away, the thickness is essentially zero. So a thin lens just means um, that, that we can basically ignore the, the separation between the two surfaces of the lens. Now, there are two types of thin lenses. The first type is called a converging lens. So when the light rays come in parallel, uh, let's say you have some object out at infinity here. Remember when you have a, an object that's very far away, the light rays come in essentially parallel. So we have the light rays come in essentially parallel here. A converging lens will converge all of the light rays to a single point here, and this is called the focal point. And it will form a real image here because the, the light rays really are going through this point. So this will be a, uh, a real image at the focal point. And for this reason, it's called a converging lens. So for a converging lens, we have two focal lengths because uh, on either side of the lens, we have uh, a focal point. So whether you have the parallel rays coming in this way it will converge the rays to a point right here, or you could have them coming in the other way and it will just converge the rays to a focal point on the other side. So we have two focal points, one on either side, and the distance from the center of the lens is called the focal length. Now the focal length of a converging lens is positive because as you can see here, the focal point is on the same side as the outgoing rays. So obviously the outgoing rays are going in this direction, so our focal point is on that same side, so we call that a uh, positive focal length. And you'll also see a converging lens sometimes called a uh, positive lens because it has a positive focal length. And just like we had uh, last time, if you, instead of having parallel rays coming in, if you instead put an object at this focal point, so if we put an object here, the light rays coming out of it will emerge parallel from the lens. So remember from our last lecture, that was another way to uh, define the focal point, was that if you put an object there, the light rays will become parallel once they exit the lens. All right, so now we're gonna uh, derive a formula, much like we did for our previous cases, we're gonna derive another formula that relates the object distance, the image distance, and the focal length for a converging lens. Now the first thing we notice is that this angle alpha here is, this angle and this angle are the same because we have one ray that goes this way and then we have this straight line here. So we know that this angle and this angle, when we have two lines crossing like that, will be congruent. So this angle alpha is the same as this angle is alpha. And if we look at, so we're looking at this triangle and this triangle. And since alpha is the same here and these are both right triangles, we know that this angle and this angle are also the same. And if we have a triangle or two triangles where all of their angles are the same, that means that those two triangles are similar. So we can write that this triangle, PQO, so O is the, the point right here in the middle. So triangle PQO is similar to this triangle here. So that's triangle P prime, Q prime, O. Now, if those two triangles are similar, remember the uh, sides of similar triangles are all in a ratio to each other. So if I take the ratio of this side and this side, it will be the same as the ratio of this side and this side because my triangles are similar. So I have here, the object height is this side of the triangle Y. And I'm taking the ratio with the object distance, which is S. And I'm saying that this ratio is going to be equal to this side of the triangle, which is the image height. But don't forget, this is uh, inverted here, so this is gonna get a negative Y prime because it's uh, upside down. And then this distance from the center of the lens to point P prime is the 
image distance. So this is s prime. So these two ratios are the same. And now I can just rewrite this equation as y prime over y is equal to s prime, negative s prime over s. And now let's keep that for a second. And now we're going to look at some other triangles. So let's get rid of all this. So now I'm going to look at this triangle, oops, this triangle, and this triangle. So again, we have two right angles here. Now for the same reason, I have this angle beta and this angle beta are the same. So that means again that my two triangles are similar because if this angle and this angle and then this angle and this angle are the same, that means that this angle up here and this angle have to be the same, so my two triangles are similar. So now I have my triangle, uh, let's see, we'll call that OAF2, so the triangle from the center to this height A to the focal point is similar to this triangle. We'll call that, uh, we'll call that P prime Q prime F2. So those two triangles are similar now, which again means that we can take the ratio of the sides to find another uh, relation like this. So let's take the ratio of this side and this side. So this side is going to be the same as the object height here, right? Because this line just came in parallel, so this height is y. So we're going to have y with uh, and then the ratio with this side here. So this side is just the focal length, right? Because we're going from the center to uh, the focal point will just give us the focal length f. And so that is going to be equal to this side with this side. So that's y prime. And again, it's negative because it's upside down. And then this distance is the image distance minus the focal length, right? If I just want this little side here, I can just do this whole side, which is s prime minus the focal length, which is just f. So I get uh, s prime minus f. And now this I can rewrite as y prime over y is equal to negative s minus, sorry, s prime minus f over s. Okay, so now what I can do is I have one equation where I have y prime over y, and then I have another equation where I have y prime over y. So what I'm going to do is just set these two equations equal to each other and just get rid of the y prime over y. So I'll do that uh, on the next page. So I had uh, so I had y prime over y is equal to negative s prime over s, and then I had y prime over y was equal to negative s prime minus f over f. So now I just have to set these two equal to each other. So I'll have negative s prime over s is equal to negative s prime minus f over f. And I can see right away that my negatives cancel. So those are going to cancel right there. And then I'll have s prime over s equals. And now what I'm going to do is just break up this fraction here so that I just have it as two separate terms. So I'm just going to rewrite that as s prime over f minus f over f, which f over f is just 1. So this is going to be 1. So now what I'm going to do is just move this over a little bit. So I'm going to move the 1 to the other side. And now what I'm going to do is divide everything by s prime. So I'm going to divide everything by s prime so that now I get 1 over s plus 1 over s prime equals 1 over f. And so now this will give me, this is my relationship between the object uh, distance, the image distance, and the focal length for a converging thin lens. So I rewrote that here, so we just have the uh, uh, the same equation and all of our same sign conventions are going to apply where s prime is positive since the image is on the same side as the outgoing light, f is positive since our focal point is on the same side as the outgoing light. So this is our main equation for uh, our converging lens.
And then here I just uh, rewrote the sign convention again. So I'll skip over that. And then we also have the same equation uh, for the magnification. So the same equation that we used uh, in the last lecture, we can use again for the magnification where the lateral magnification is equal to the object, sorry, the image height over the object height, which is equal to the negative of the image distance over the object distance. Now, for a converging lens, we know that we said that uh, S prime and S are both positive. So this tells us that for a converging lens, the uh, image is always inverted, right? Because we have that negative sign there always then. So the image will always be upside down. Then we can have what's called a diverging lens as well. So now, if we have a thin lens where it's kind of like uh, concave on both sides, if we have parallel rays come in, when they refract through the lens, they're going to look like they're coming from a point in front of the lens. So all of these rays here look like they're coming from this point. So again, we have two focal points, but our uh, like main primary focal point is on the left side of the lens. It's on the same side as the incoming light, or you could say it's on the side opposite the outgoing light. So that means that the focal length for a diverging lens is negative. Uh, so we also call a diverging lens sometimes a negative lens. And then obviously the, the main point of a diverging lens, or the reason we call it a diverging lens is because your parallel rays come in and they diverge away from the lens. And then we also have for a diverging lens, if you have rays that are directed towards this focal point here, so these rays are directed towards this point, when they come out the other side of the lens, they're going to be parallel. And then uh, I obviously messed up my spacing a little bit here, but any lens that is thinner at the top and thicker in the middle is gonna be a converging lens. So it doesn't matter uh, if like one side is flat and then the other side is a little bit convex or both sides are a little bit convex uh, or both sides look like this. If it's thinner up here uh, than in the middle, it's gonna be a converging lens. And then uh, the other case is that it's thicker at either end than it is in the middle. So if you have that, then it's a diverging lens. And I'm, I don't expect you to like remember these different names, just all you have to do is remember what a converging lens uh, looks like, thinner at the top, thicker in the middle, and then a diverging lens is thicker at the top, thinner in the middle. And our equations that we had for a converging lens, so th this equation applies equally well to a diverging lens as well, and so does this. So this, this equation applies to both diverging and converging lenses. You could do the exact same uh, derivation that we did for the converging lens. You can do it for a diverging lens and you will end up with the same equation. So this equation works equally well for both. So any type of thin lens we have, we can use that. So now let's move on to what's called the lens maker's equation. So we're going to derive this one. So here, what we have is an object at point P. So this is our distance S. So since here we technically have um, two refracting surfaces, what we can do is apply the equation that we had in Tuesday's lecture uh, where we had the equation for the radius of curvature and how it relates to the index of refraction, the image and object distance. What we do is we're basically gonna apply that twice because we have one, uh, you know, it refracts once at this side and then it refracts again over here. So the first one is going to create uh, an image over here. And then our second surface will create our final image that we, we finally see once you have kind of those two refracting surfaces together. So let's derive that. So let's just write our, uh, we're gonna write our equation once, whoops, once for this first surface and then again for this second surface here. So we have NA over S, uh, we'll call this S1 plus nb over s prime one. 
is equal to nb minus na over the radius of curvature of the first uh, surface. So then for the second uh, uh, lens or the second surface, we're going to have nb divided by the object distance. So now our first surface creates an image here. That's our S1 uh, prime. Then this acts as the object for our second surface. So now since our new object is, uh, I'll just write, so that is we're going to call S2, our uh, second object, plus NC over S2 prime is the second image distance, and it's going to be nc minus nb over r2. And both of these radius, uh, radii of curvature are positive because they're both uh, on the same side as the outgoing light, the center. So now we can see here that we can replace s2 with s1 prime because now s2, these are obviously the same magnitude, but now our object our new object here, which was the image of the first surface, our object now is actually on the same side as the outgoing light. So now our object actually has a negative distance. So we can replace S2 with negative S1 prime. So let's do that. So we'll replace this with negative S1 prime and then we also see that Na and Nc are both equal to 1. So, because that's air on both sides. So we can replace both of these. Oops. We'll replace these all with 1. So Na is 1, and C is 1. Okay, so now I can uh, just add up these equations. So I'm going to add these two equations. So when I add these two equations, I get 1 over s1 plus, I'll just call it n for now since we only have one n, uh, and then plus this here is minus n over s1 prime since we have a minus there, and then plus 1 over s2 prime. And now the right hand side is just this plus this, so I have n minus 1 over r1 plus 1 minus n over r2. So I can see right away, first of all, that this and this cancel, right? So over here I have 1 plus s1, uh, sorry, 1 over s1 plus 1 over s2 prime. And then this, I can rewrite this as negative n minus 1, right? I can kind of pull a negative sign out of here and rewrite this as negative n minus 1. And now I see both my terms have an n minus 1. So I can pull out an n minus 1 now, and I'm left with 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2. And so now I can just get rid of these subscripts here too, because now this is just my object distance, and this is just my final image distance. So I have my, my first object, my original object here. After it goes through these, uh, this lens, I get a final image distance over here. And that's what I'm just calling S prime now. And now I can also see here, remember a couple of slides ago, we said that 1 over S plus 1 over S prime is equal to the focal length. So now I can see that this is also equal to the focal length. So I can just set now this and this equal to each other and that's called the lens maker's equation. So the lens maker's equation just relates the focal length of your thin lens to the index of refraction and the radius of curvature of each uh, piece of your lens. And uh, all of this has to abide by, of course, the same sign rules as we've already learned. So just to review that for the radii, so if we have an object here and we have our incoming light going this way and our final, um, uh, our final image here, this first radius over here is positive in this case because it has a radius of curvature on the same side as the outgoing light. So this one has a positive radius of curvature. This uh, R1 is positive. And then here, R2 is negative because this radius of curvature, the center of curvature, is on the same side as the 
incoming light or the opposite side of the outgoing light. So this one gets a negative. And again, in this case, since this is a converging lens, we see that S and S prime are both positive, so our magnification will end up being negative and the image will be inverted. Now, just like in our uh, last lecture, we had a graphical method. Uh, you have a graphical method for uh, converging and diverging lenses as well. So for this graphical method, the first thing you want to do is draw a ray that's parallel to the axis. So this is our axis here. So you draw a, your first ray that's parallel. And then you know since it's parallel, it's coming in parallel to the axis, it's going to go directly through that focal point there. So then you draw it going through the focal point. And now you have a second ray that will go through the center of the lens. So you have this one coming in directly through the center. And now when you have a ray passing directly through the center, it doesn't get refracted at all. So it just keeps going directly through and meets that other ray right here. So this one just goes directly through. And then you do the same thing um, kind of, but in reverse. So then you have a ray that goes through the focal point on this side. So it goes through the focal point, meets the lens here, and then you know if it's coming, uh, if it's coming through the focal point on this side, it has to emerge parallel to the axis again. So then this ray gets uh, emerges parallel, and all three of your rays meet right here, and now this is where your image is located, and this is its height. And you can see this one is obviously inverted, and it's going to be some distance, you know, P prime away from your the center of your lens here. Now you can do the same thing for a diverging lens. So for a diverging lens, again, you start off with your first ray that's parallel to the axis. So you do your ray that's parallel to the axis, and you know that this ray is going to get refracted so that it looks like it's coming from that first focal point. So this ray you're going to draw so that it looks like it's coming from this focal point here and then diverges away. Then your second uh, ray through the center of the lens again does not get refracted at all so it just goes straight through and comes out the other side un, uh, unchanged. And then your third ray you'll draw straight through that focal point on the other side. So you'll have a ray starting here and you'll just draw it like it goes straight through this focal point and we know that a ray that's aimed at the focal point here will emerge parallel to the axis. So again, you just draw that one back and see where all of your rays uh, converge here. And so that is going to be right here. So you're going to have a virtual image now, which is upright, but uh, shorter than your original uh, object. Okay, so that's the, the graphical method. Uh, obviously for the diverging lens, it's a little more confusing, um, but for the uh, converging lens, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, okay, so let's do an example. So for this example, we have uh, this diagram from a few slides ago. So let's suppose that the absolute values of the radii of curvature uh, of this lens are each 10 centimeters, and the index of refraction of glass is 1.52. What is the focal length of the lens? So this is easy. All we have to do is just plug a uh, in our numbers into our formula. So our lens maker's equation is this. And now all we have to do is just plug things in. So we said that the radius of curvature of both of them is 10 centimeters, but the absolute value was 10 centimeters. So the radius of curvature of the first one, since the center of curvature is on the same side as the outgoing light, this radius of curvature is uh, sorry, this radius of curvature is positive. But for R2, since this center of curvature is on the same side is on the opposite side as the outgoing light, that means that this radius uh, is negative. So this one is negative 10 centimeters. And then all we have to do is plug that in. So 1 over f is equal to 1.52 minus 1 over 1. Uh, R1 was 10 centimeters minus a negative 10. We'll give you a positive 10. So this is 0.52 times 2 over 10. And this comes out to a positive 9.6 centimeters. 
So the focal length of this lens is 9.6 centimeters. And then for part B, uh, so I forgot to add in the diagram there, so that's just, uh, oops, but that was just a diverging lens. So, uh, you know, it's just a lens that, that looked like this. So we're gonna have the same idea, except for a diverging lens, R1 now is gonna be negative, right? Because our first surface, the radius of curvature is over here. So that's the opposite side is the outgoing light. So our R1 now is going to be negative whereas our R2 will be positive for a diverging lens. So we'll have, uh, let's do it down here. So for part B, we'll have R1 now is negative 10 centimeters and R2 is positive 10 centimeters. So our focal length is again 1.52 minus one. Then we have one over negative 10 minus one over 10. So we get 0.52 times now negative 2 over 10. So now this comes out to negative 9.6 centimeters. So we can see that we got a positive focal length for our converging or positive lens, and we got a negative focal point for our negative focal length for our diverging or negative lens. All right, now let's do another example, but uh, let's use the magnification now. So here we have a beam of parallel rays spreads out after passing through a thin diverging lens as if the rays all came from a point 20 centimeters from the center of the lens. You want to use this lens to form an erect virtual image that is one third the height of the object. A, where should the object be, pla be placed and where will the image be? Okay, so let's write down uh, everything that we know. So we know that the, uh, the lens is diverging and saying as if the rays all came from a point 20 centimeters uh, from the center of the lens. So that means that they're saying the focal point is 20 centimeters. So our focal point is 20 centimeters, but it's a diverging lens. So we know that the focal point of a, uh, sorry, the focal length of a diverging lens is negative. So it's negative 20 centimeters. And the image is virtual and one third the height of the object and erect so that we know that the magnification is plus one third. And where should the object be placed and where will the image be? So that means what is S and what is S prime? So we have two equations here. So the two equations that we can use now, we can use uh, this equation then we can also use the equation for magnification, right? So we can use both of these equations. So let's use the magnification to solve for S. So let's say the magnification is negative S prime over S. So that means that negative, uh, sorry, S prime is equal to negative S over three. So now let's take this and plug it into this equation. So we'll get uh, one over S minus S and then three on top there from S over three is equal to uh, one over negative 20 because the focal length is negative 20. So now this becomes negative two over S is equal to uh, negative one over 20. So we can see that S is positive 40 centimeters. So the object distance is positive 40 centimeters. And now we can just use this equation to solve for the uh, image distance. So we just know that one third is equal to negative S prime over 40, so we can just solve for S prime and we get negative uh, 40 over three is equal to S prime. And that comes out to negative uh, 13.3 centimeters. So our image is uh, virtual and it's placed at 13.3 centimeters to the left of the lens. So let's say our lens is diverging, it's over here. This is the axis. 
the object is over here at 40 centimeters, the image is over here at 13.3 centimeters. Okay, now let's do one more example that's a little bit uh, uh, more challenging since this has uh, two lenses. So here we have two converging lenses, A and B. The focal lengths are eight and six centimeters. Uh, they're placed 36 centimeters apart. Both lenses have the same optic axis. An object eight centimeters high is placed 12 centimeters to the left of lens A. Find the position, size, and orientation of the image produced by the lenses in combination. So let's write down everything that we know. So first we have uh, these two lenses here. And this is the optic axis there. So we have focal length one is eight centimeters. Focal length two is six centimeters. They're both positive since they're converging lenses. They're positive lenses. So both our focal lengths are positive. This distance is 36 centimeters. Uh, and then an object eight centimeters high. So Y1, the height of the first object is eight centimeters. And it is placed 12 centimeters to the left of lens A. So we have this object here, and this is 12 centimeters. So that means that S1 is 12 centimeters. The object distance for the first object is 12 centimeters. So let's first find the image distance just with the first lens. So the first lens, we're going to use this equation. So we'll call this, uh, we'll call this image 1. is equal to 1 over s uh, f. So our first image distance, so our first object distance is 1 over 12 centimeters plus 1 over s prime is equal to 1 over 8 centimeters was that first focal length. So if you solve this for s prime, you get that s prime is 24 centimeters. So that means that we have an image here. So our first image is 24 centimeters to the right of lens A. So this is lens A and this is lens B. Now, this is going to serve as the object for lens B. So now we have an object here that's 12 centimeters, right? Because now it's 12 centimeters from lens B. This entire distance is 36 centimeters and the image is 24 centimeters from lens A. That means it's 12 centimeters from lens B. So let's now do image B. We'll call it image two. We're again gonna have one over S, uh, one over S prime is equal to one over F. So now our object distance is 12 centimeters. So we have one over 12 plus one over S prime is the second image now. And then one over the focal length of lens B was six centimeters. So this is one over six. So now this image distance comes out to positive 12 centimeters. So we get our final answer of positive 12 centimeters. That means that we have finally the image is over here and it is 12 centimeters from the center of lens B. So that's the position. Now to find the size and orientation we have to look at the magnification. So let's look at the magnification uh, from the first lens A. So M is negative S prime over S. So negative S prime is negative 24 over 12 is the original object distance. So this is obviously negative two. So this image here is two times as big, but we have a negative, so it's inverted. So this image here was actually inverted and twice as big. So now let's look at the magnification for the second lens. So M negative S prime over S, our image distance was 12, so we get a negative 12 there. And then the object distance was also 12, right? Because it was 12 centimeters away over here. So the object distance was 12. So that gives us negative one. 
So you might think that negative 1 is our final answer, but you have to be careful because lens A inverted the image and made it twice as big, right? The magnification for lens A was negative 2. So it's now twice as big and inverted. And that is now our object for lens B. So now lens B takes an image that's twice as big and inverted, again inverts it, right, because we have the negative here, again inverts it and makes it uh, one time as big. So it doesn't change the size, but it inverts it. So if you invert and invert an image, you get back to an upright image. So this was upright. So our final magnification actually, so our M final was actually negative two times negative one, right? It was the magnification of the first one times the magnification of the second uh, lens, or we'll call that A and B. So our final magnification is actually just positive two. So it's just twice as big and upright. Okay, so now let's just quickly go over some applications of these uh, lenses. So the the most obvious one is a camera. So a camera just takes an object, a real object obviously over here. Uh, it has some lenses that it goes through which form a real image on the photographic medium. So for digital cameras, it's an electronic sensor. Uh, for older cameras, it's like an actual um, like film, uh, an actual like physical medium. So, so we're not gonna get too into cameras. Um, that's just the basic setup of it. Uh, the other thing is the eye. So our eyes are essentially spherical, uh, about 2.5 centimeters from front to back. So you have an object in front of your eye. It obviously goes through your pupil, um, and then it forms an image on the back of your eye on the retina. And then from there, it gets transmitted to your brain uh, and all that stuff. So. The image is uh, actually inverted and your brain like right sides it up, uh, which is cool. Um, and there's a couple different things that can happen to affect your vision uh, if it's not perfect. So the first one is called nearsightedness. Uh, and if you're nearsighted, all that means is that the image that your eye forms, instead of forming it directly on the back of your eye on the retina, it forms it a little bit uh, uh, forward, so it forms it a little bit before the retina here. And then likewise, if you have, uh, if you're farsighted, the image is fo formed too far back. So in both of these cases, that's why it looks blurry to you, is because where the light rays meet your cornea, they're diverging a little bit. Either they haven't fully converged yet, if the image is formed back here, or they're, they've already converged and are diverging away. Uh, if you're nearsighted. So either way, it's going to look blurry to you. And then the other uh, issue is called astigmatism. So astigmatism is uh, basically your eye is like misshapen a little bit uh, on the front so that it can't focus on vertical and horizontal things at the same time. So if you try to focus on uh, like a window where it has the vertical and horizontal, you can't focus on both of those. Uh, and obviously both of your eyes don't have to have the same problem. Uh, I personally have an astigmatism in one and then am nearsighted in the other. So each uh, lens of my glasses do two different things. Okay, so that's that. And then uh, the other thing I want to talk about are uh, magnifiers and telescopes. So the important thing for a magnifier is the angular size. So the angular size is basically just how much of your field of vision does the object take up. So in this case, we have a little caterpillar uh, you know, you have a whole 360 degrees uh, potentially here, and the caterpillar just takes up, you know, like one or two degrees of it. So the angular uh, size is usually very small. And now what a magnifying glass will do essentially is it just increases the angular size of these little objects. So you have some object here at height y, and that corresponds to an angular size. And then what the magnifying glass does is basically just make an image of the object so that it looks like it's out at infinity so that the rays come in essentially parallel uh, from this image and that increases the angular size. So I think you only have one question um, on this stuff in the homework and it just need, wants you to find the angular size. So, uh, or the magnification, I forget. But um, 
The magnification for a magnifying glass is just given by the ratio of the two angular sizes. So theta prime over theta. So that would just be the angular size of the image divided by the angular size of the original object. And you can also rewrite uh, the angular size of the image. So theta prime is also given by y over f, which would be the height of the original object divided by the uh, focal length of that magnifier. So uh, I just wrote that right here. So this is just the angular magnification. This is what pops up most of the time when you're talking about magnifiers or uh, anything like that. So this is really the only equation you need to know uh, for magnifiers and cameras and stuff. Um, your book has a lot of extra details about cameras. Uh, I'm not going to test you on that, so I figure, you know, if you're interested, obviously uh, you can read it. But since I'm not going to uh, test you on that, we won't uh, go over it in lecture. Um, then for microscopes, uh, they're pretty much like we did the compound lens problem uh, just a few slides ago. They basically just take, uh, you have an object here. So your object starts out here. You have the eyepiece and you have the objective. So that's just what they call uh, the two lenses. So this is just like lens A and lens B. So you have your object here. It goes through the first lens, forms an image here, goes through the second lens, and that second lens then forms a much larger image back here. So then this is your final image that you see, which is obviously much larger than the original object. But it's essentially just a compound lens. So if you understand, uh, understood our compound lens problem from a few slides ago, that's basically all a microscope does. Uh, okay, and then lastly, telescopes. So telescopes are again compound lenses and they work pretty much you know almost the exact same way as microscopes but for telescopes since what you're looking at is so far away whereas compared to a microscope the thing you're looking at is like you know just a couple inches in front of you with a telescope the object is super far away so the light rays come in essentially parallel so the light rays come in basically parallel here uh, they form they go through the first lens, which again, you're called the objective and the eyepiece. Uh, they form an image, and then when it goes through the other lens, then that then forms another image that is magnified. So one of the common uh, ways to build a telescope basically is you have these parallel rays come in, so the rays are coming in perfectly parallel. They hit, uh, most of the time it's a mirror uh, in those big, big telescopes. They hit a mirror and then this mirror will reflect the rays back to its focal point and then you can basically take a snapshot right there uh, where the rays all focus and form a real image and then you'll that's that's how you get a picture uh, in a lot of these big telescopes so this is like the kind of telescope that like galileo used and stuff i think he invented it um not sure though but uh the bigger the bigger telescopes usually use um, mirrors and not just uh, two lenses and now obviously the most famous telescope is obviously the Hubble. So I think it was in uh, 1995, I'm not sure, but um, just a couple of years after they launched the Hubble telescope, they wanted to see what was in space where it looked it looked empty. So what they did was they found a section of the sky that was like super tiny, it was like, uh, like half a degree of the sky or something like that. Uh, and they chose a very, very empty space. So somewhere where it looked like there was absolutely nothing in all the previous uh, pictures that looked like just totally black empty sky and they trained the Hubble on it for I think 10 days and when they took the pictures back this is what they saw so this is uh, not the original this is an updated version um, but this is what you see if you look into what looks like a totally empty patch of sky you actually see all of these uh, just like hundreds of galaxies everywhere so these are actually like some of the oldest things we can see uh, you know, these ones back here that are red are like just basically right after the Big Bang. So there's a, a whole lot of galaxies uh, out there. So this is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And this actually contains the oldest uh, thing that we can see. So this one here, so this is a, uh, another picture of it. So right in here where it looks like there's nothing, there's this one tiny little red dot. And this tiny little uh, red dot is what we think is the oldest uh, galaxy that we can see. 
and it corresponds to a time 480 million years after the Big Bang. Now, since the Big Bang was like 13 billion years ago, I mean, this is, you know, super young. This is basically like right after the Big Bang uh, in the grand scheme of things. So this is the oldest thing that uh, we think we can see. And uh, yeah, so that's really it today. Um, you could spend a while uh, looking through all the galaxies here. I mean, some of these you can see, uh, you know, it looks like fake kind of, but uh, it's not. Um, but anyway, okay. So uh, that is it for today. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time, obviously, for a midterm review like last time. But yeah, um, so good luck, and I will see you guys on Tuesday.